You have located Geekfest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. <laughs> Everybody and welcome once again to Geekfest Rants. My name is Carlos Perón, and today we are going to take a different route. We are going to kind of skirt around the genre topic. However, there is a very strong connection to some genre material. What I'm going to talk about is the rock band and artist Huey Lewis and the News. Uh, the biggest connection that I can think of is the movie Back to the Future and the songs that he wrote for that movie. But because a lot of the things we talk about in this show involve uh, nostalgic items, uh, things, movies, television, and music at this point, and the phenomenon of being a fan of something, you know, how it also affects you through music. And this is how I have a connection um, you know, to being a super, super fan of Huey Lewis and the News. So let's get started with today's show. Uh, what kind of music do you usually have here? Oh, we got both kinds. We got country and western. If you don't eat your meat... You can't have any pudding! Yeah. How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? Do you mind if we dance with your dates? Oh, no, not at all. Go right ahead. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. Wash the hair. No, I work on my hair a long time. And he hit it. He hits my hair. Guess what? I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. I want to talk a little bit about what I would consider to be my favorite singer band, if you will, Huey Lewis and the News. Nowadays. Most young people probably have no clue who this person is. This is uh, Huey Lewis from the 80s, you know, MTV. That's where he blew up. Back in 83, I believe, is when the sports album came out with, you know, the majority of his hits all hitting. And probably that's when he kind of came into my radar in terms of all of a sudden, you know, being able to identify and connect with the one specific singer. You know, I've always had this thing where it's hard to kind of jump on a group or a singer that's been already pre-established because I always feel like, oh, I'm kind of, you know, jumping on that bandwagon late in the game or, you know, there's already too much history behind the individual, you know, to make that extra connection that you normally don't make with all other singers. For example, take something like Pink Floyd. 
Pink Floyd is a monster. And it's a monster that's been around for many, many years, even before I got into Pink Floyd. So I love Pink Floyd. I love their music. I respect their music. But it was harder for me to make that connection, to take that ownership. Now, I don't know if this is part of that whole fan thing, you know, uh, of the fandom psychology that I've we've kind of touched upon on many other shows where you identify with something and because nobody has touched it yet it becomes a part of you and you grab onto it and you just kind of continue with it and you defend it a lot because you start to feel that it's part of you again it's a typical fandom phenomenon for me Hugh Lewis was kind of like that and is still kind of like that because even though he had officially two previous albums before sports. One of them was self-titled Huey Lewis and the News, and the other one was Picture This. It wasn't until sports hit in 83. Again, I'm, I'm about 13 years old, ripe age for movies, television, music, you know, that kind of thing to, to completely, you know, whack out your system, that I was like, oh my God, this guy is just incredible. Also, keep in mind, this is the beginning of the MTV wave. Given the fact that I still didn't have cable at the time, you know, MTV was another way to feed, visually feed, not only music-wise like you normally would on a radio station where I would normally hear this music, but visually through music videos, being able to be fed this data, (laughs) consume this entertainment. Back then, and again, I talked about this before, I think I didn't have cable, my area of Uh, New York, Queens, where I lived, still hadn't dug the trenches to bury the cable lines. That happened much, much later in the 80s for me. However, because of that, because it was the fact that it was the beginning of cable permeating major cities, you know, in a serious manner, and it was taking time, there were certain television shows, Friday Night Videos for one, that we had a channel called U68. I talked about it too, where which it's a UHF channel that played horrible reception, but it was music videos. It was like their answer to MTV, their free answer to MTV. It was horrible, 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 horrible. It was like trying to watch these, you know, scrambled porn. <laughs> the reception was horrible, but at least it was like, well, I don't have MTV, but I can kind of hear and almost see a music video. That was U68. But NBC, I think, had Friday night videos, and they were they were like uh, different channels that played, you know, at certain times, usually at night, a, a rendition of vid- or a video show that would last, I don't know, an hour or two, whatever. But anyway, Huey Lewis in the News, I Want a New Drug. That was their huge, huge monster, monster hit, and that's what kind of got me into Huey Lewis. I want a new drug. He, to me, and still to this day, represents a combination of 80s rock and classic rock, but not classic rock like 60s rock. I'm talking 50s rock. I'm talking Chuck Berry rock, which is my one of my favorite, you know, early rock performers. I kind of got that, that combination of the modern and the old all wrapped into one band. And with Huey Lewis... You know, it was that was it for me. I was done. I was like, oh my God, this guy's great. So I remember through that first album that I purchased, let me think. I'm pretty sure it must have been Columbia House. Oh my God, Columbia House was some it was an addiction I had at the time. I remember there was BMG Music Service, there was Columbia House, then they had VHS versions, you know, movie club versions of those. Then they had DVD versions of those. It was incredible at the time. Even Laserdisc. I think I even had a Laserdisc version of the Columbia House or whatever uh, manner of purchasing uh, media. But anyway, at the time, my first one was records, albums. And sports was that album for me. That album... And many other albums, but sports, it was just, there were so many great songs. And and you had that, you know, again, for, for somebody who's kind of early in understanding albums in the music industry, you know, you had your hits that you could hear on the radio, but you also had these other songs that got, they were like, well, they, these songs are still pretty good. It's like, oh my God, they're actually pretty good. And some of those songs you could hear, you know, if you put the time, if you actually 
listen to the radio when they did the top 40, you know, again, who has the time? Even back then, you know, today I couldn't imagine somebody sitting down in front of a radio to listen to the top 40, unless you're, you know, in a car, in a trip, you know, and you just have nothing to do. But back then, you could listen to the top 40. And yes, sometimes these these B-sides, if you call again, if you know what a B-side is, you have your sing, you know, you have your album, and then they would also sell you the single. So if you didn't want to spend the 10 bucks on the album, you could for through two, two, three bucks, you could buy a single. And the single would have that hit song. And on the B side, when you flipped it, remember these are 45s. If you know what I'm talking about, revolutions per minute as opposed to 33, which is what the album was. But anyway, the B side of the 45, the small single, had another song, and that song would usually be a song that you're not that familiar with. But it was a way of kind of selling you another song to kind of entice you into, well, if you like the hit, and if you like this other song, hey, maybe you can go and go and buy the rest of the album. <laughs> you cheap bastard. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that that's that's advertising. Anyway. That's how it used to be. And yeah, that's sometimes, you know, you're like, oh, wow, the B-side or the other songs that are on the album, you would kind of hear sometimes them climbing the charts a little bit. But obviously, once you get to the top 20 or the top 10, those are what's considered to be the, the hits, the, you know, number one, that kind of stuff. But yeah, I Want a New Drug was great. The music video was funny. It always looked like they were having so much fun in, the, in these videos. And I remember I had decided at that time, it's like, okay, that's it. This is it. This is it. This is going to be my first concert. I want to see these guys play live. I watched them on TV. Sometimes they would appear on shows and sometimes specials or something like that. Music videos would play ad nauseum. I want to see them for real. And the first time I was actually able to attend the concert was for their performance of their 4 tour. Now, 4 was the follow-up album that they came up with after... Sports. Now, what's interesting about four is that this is something that I've learned little by little all over the place. That when it comes to either movie directors, singers, all types of artists, a lot of artists don't want to just repeat themselves. They want to grow, and it makes perfect sense. You know, as an artist, people grow into different things, they don't just do the same thing over and over and over again. And depending on what your art is, you might have the luxury of being able to grow. A singer basically decides a different style or a different area they want to explore. An actor hopefully gets offered enough roles that he can diversify, you know, maybe a comedy, a serious film, a sci-fi film, you know, a musical. You know, they, they can do different things and not just play the bad guy, the bad guy, the bad guy. Some actors are stuck. That's called typecasting. They're stuck playing that kind of character all the time. But in music, you really are a little bit more in control because you're putting out the music you want. Now, granted, the audience can react negatively to it and say, no, I don't want you singing opera. I want you singing heavy metal, <laughs> you know, and, and they won't pay to have you sing certain kind of music. And I'm sure that will also influence the artist. If the artist doesn't see any money coming in from all these different things they're trying, they'll just kind of go back to what they normally would do. With Huey Lewis, what was interesting is that between sports and four, there was a slight change. Sports was more rock, 80s rock. Four was more, a little bit slower. It had some, you know, pretty good hits in there that were kind of hits, kind of like heavier rock kind of hits, but they also had a lot of more slow down kind of stuff too at the same time. Now, 4 came out in 1986, three years after sports. And like I said, I did manage to go to the concert. Out of that album, you had, for example, Jacob's Ladder. You know, they, they had some, some pretty good hits. Stuck With You, Hip To Be Square, which was, again, it's a typical Huey Lewis kind of song. It's, it's a very pounding kind of song. But here's the thing, with Stuck With You, I remember I was kind of looking forward to it, but I need to sidetrack a little bit here, because between these two albums, Huey Lewis and the News participated in the movie Back to the Future. Now, not only did he participate as an actor, he had a little cameo, which is funny how he even got that role, it was a fluke, 
And it was a, he didn't want to do it, and he ended up doing it, and he was great, perfect, whatever. But the real reason why he participated in the movie was because they wanted him to do two songs for the movie. And he ended up doing The Power of Love and Back in Time. Now, let me go back another step again. With the sports album, you had hits like I Want a New Drug, If This Is It... Heart of Rock and Roll. And Heart and Soul. There were many other more, but those were the big ones. Those were huge, huge songs. With the Back to the Future movie, The Power of Love was another gigantic hit song. It was even nominated for an Oscar. That's how big that song was. It became my favorite song. That's the power of love. Now, I think I've mentioned this in the past, is that I'm not a big lyrics person. I'm more of a music person. And sometimes I don't really pay that much attention to the lyrics. In other words, I, I do try to kind of sing along with the song, and I do try to get the lyrics right, but a lot of times, it's, it, I know it's an ongoing comedy routine. I think SNL did it, where people are singing to the song, and they're just making up their own lyrics because they already know the song, and they're just kind of making up words. Yeah, I'm kind of like that. I, I really don't research it too much, and then one day I decide to research, and then I realize, man, was I wrong about what I was singing about. <laughs> <laughs> or what I thought they were singing about. And, oh my God, this is so different. But yeah, I never was big into the into the words. And to, to this day, uh, I would say probably 90% of my favorite songs, I, I really do not know exactly the words to them. However, Power of Love, music-wise, again, to me, the music. I love the music. I love the guitar solos. In, in a lot of his songs and a lot of his music especially power love i love the video they did so simple very simple video they also had back in time not as big of a hit but great song fits the movie perfectly so for me you know power of love became my it is still to this day my favorite song period and it's not so much because i'm into love songs again i'm not more of a much of a lyric guy but the music, the, that music is, the to me, the perfect, perfect combination of 80s rock with a little bit of the history behind rock to go along. Like I said, it has that bluesy, has that Chuck Berry in, in the background. I can hear all that stuff in these songs. But anyway, I have all of a sudden, you know, all of the sports hits on my hands and I got Power of Love and I'm like, oh my God, this next album is going to be amazing. I am so dying to, uh, to, to, to listen to what comes next. What can this guy do next? It, it, he cannot go. My expectations were through the roof. So because at the time he was still pretty big, he was a big, big performer. I remember, again, I don't know exactly where it was. I don't know if it was a uh, Friday night videos or some TV special or something where they were going to premiere the new song stuck with you from four. That was what they were targeting as their, their, their potential hit from the album. And again, these are things that get figured out ahead of time by, by executives. I assume, I assume, or, or, or maybe the creatives, maybe the manager, some people figure out what's going to be the next hit. So I watched the video for stuck with you and I'm like, Oh crap. <laughs> Stuck With You is a very, very different kind of song than I Want A New Drug or The Power Of Love. Yes, it is a little more romantic. Now, granted, if you really read all of his songs, a lot of them are very, you know, they're romantic kind of songs. It's about a girl. It's about missing a girl, losing a girl, or something to do with a girl. Okay, I get it. I understand that. But Stuck With You was a much more slow kind of take it easy kind of song it didn't have any of the punch any of the the raw rock part that i really really liked and i was somewhat disappointed i'm like the video is great i love the video you could tell they spent more money and they had more things to do and they're having fun but it's like 
yeah, but where's the where's the where's the other stuff? You know, where's the where's the better stuff? <laughs> but again, when you look at the album, when they finally released the album, you know, there were songs like Jacob's Ladder, a little more rocky kind of song, more in in the vein of 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 the power of love, let's say. And they have Hip to Be Square again. Going back to basics, Hip to Be Square was more like. Not exactly, but more like I want a new drug or, you know, more of the hard hitting, harder rock and roll, you know, that kind of stuff uh, that, that, that he became famous for. So there was definitely a, a change taking place. So at this time, you know, just like, again, it happens to me with most of my fandoms, I start going backwards. I'm like, well, wait a minute. If this director directed this great movie I want, what did he do before that? And what did he do before that and before that? Well... I started going backwards with his albums, and I picked up Picture This, and I picked up their self-titled Huey Lewis and the News. The Huey Lewis and the News album, uh, it's very fresh. It's a freshman album. It's the definition of a fresh. It's what they do first. And at that time, from what I understand, if you read a little bit of the, the history of the band, they were, you know, they traveled in Europe quite a bit. They came back to the States. There was a big, uh, from what I understand, punk kind of wave coming around that time you know i guess it was the late 70s and uh, you know out, out of england and that to me is what seems to influence a little bit of that first album they put out you know the songs are but they're very fast and they're very they're not heavy metal but they you you know what little i know about punk music i can kind of hear a little bit of that influence in their music Their second album, Picture This, was a little more chill, a little more ball. I don't know if the word is ballad, but it, it was like more softer rock with a slightly rockier edge building into it. And it had, I believe, one hit song that made it all the way to number seven called Do You Believe in Love? Do you believe in love? And Do You Believe in Love is more of a song that, yes, that kind of song, I could kind of see it being in sports. But that's that was the transition that the band was going through. They were changing from a very freshman, raw, maybe angry, punky, uh, rock kind of band to a little more commercial. I don't Again, I don't know, commercial is an insult, but a little more listening. You can listen to it a little more, more palatable, slower, rockier kind of band. And sports was perfect. It was the perfect spot for them. With Picture This, you also had another song called Working for a Living that was also a very, very good song for the time. Again, it was a harder rock song. It's a kind of song that they continue to play, you know, in future concerts. It's a song that kind of carries on on their music list. So yeah, definitely Working for a Living was another song that you could kind of put on their top 10. If you do go back, there was transitioning. There were already changes taking place. The band never stayed the same even before sports. But, you know, again, I'm 13 years old. Uh, the world is, a, is mine, and I expect everything to appease me, <laughs> like most kids do. So I was able to go to the concert. I love the concert. I enjoyed it. It was the first time of many times that I saw Huey Lewis. To this day, there was a song that they played that I still do not know what it was. And I'm thinking maybe it came from one of their earlier albums. Maybe it was from Huey Lewis and the News, uh, the first album. I I'm not entirely sure. I, I would have to I would have to dig up. I know there's websites where they give you like the set list of old concerts. I have to dig that up to see if I can locate it because... I remember I was enjoying that song so much and not knowing what the song was because I had never heard it before. Unless, a lot of times what happens is when artists sometimes perform live, it's done at a different pitch or a different tempo. And if you're not familiar with the song, it sounds completely different when it's played a little faster or a little slower. So it, maybe it's something like that. I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, what happens after four is about two years later, they put out Small World. Small World, again, was a slightly different kind of album. It had possibly, I would say, maybe one hit titled Perfect World. No in a perfect world. 
was a music video I remember they shot it like in a garbage dump and it's about I guess I think it's kind of like an environmentally kind of sound music video theme of the of the song very good I liked it a lot of other songs in the album as usual plus another great cut there called small world just like the album in a small world There were a couple of instrumentals that I really, really enjoyed, but it also had a more like a world music feel to it too. There were certain instruments, certain sounds that were very like maybe maybe a slight Caribbean influence to it, that kind of thing. But it was kind of like a smaller album. Again, it wasn't the explosion that you got with sports, and it wasn't the follow-up loyalty that you got with four. Things were already kind of slowing down a little bit, you know, for them. The next album comes in 1991, about three years later, called Hard at Play. And this is an album that I, I would say kind of snuck up on me, at least, because at the time, I wasn't sure I was following the band that close in terms of, oh, what's next, what's next, what's next? I already had the feeling that they were slowing down, so, you know, we might not be seeing too much, you know, that often as we used to. However, music videos were still going strong, and they did were still making music videos, but Remember, the music video craze uh, had a peak, and, and it is possible that this is around the time where those music videos were peaking. The best hit that I could remember from this album is Couple Days Off. Very rock hard, you know, hip to be square, kind of beat to it, want a new drug, you know, that kind of album. But you just didn't see them that often on television anymore. They didn't make a splash that much. And obviously, again, if you don't have the hits, it's not going to get too much of a rotation on the radio. So I would say this is probably the last time that we see Huey Lewis really uh, getting into, you know, any kind of um, big noticeable rotation as far as the radio goes and their music. Up next, you have Four Courts and Several Years Ago. This came out in 1994. So they're still pretty consistent in how these albums are coming out. Obviously, with the younger years, they were turning them out much faster. But now it seems to be like every three or four years, more or less. Four Courts and Several Years Ago is a different, completely different kind of album. Because I believe the majority of the songs in this album are covers of old, like, 50s kind of rock songs. So they kind of covered a lot of stuff like that. Pretty, pretty, pretty one. Now, because most or if not all of these songs are not original, then it's a little more hard to kind of give them credit. They're doing covers. So this is their cover album tribute, if you will. Again, it didn't really get much in terms of hits, you know, because these particular covers were not, you know, even though they're 50s and 60s rock covers, you know, rhythm and blues and that kind of stuff. It didn't really get much radio play. After that, you had Plan B, which came out in 2001. This is probably the longest stretch of time that we had not seen up to this point for a Huey Lewis album. It took about seven years for this to come out, 2001. One thing to also uh, mention about the previous album was that at that point, after the four chords and several years ago they lost their bass player the bass player mario cipollina left or got fired depending on who you listen to so now we have the beginnings of the band starting to not completely fall apart but starting to lose members with plan b i do remember uh, some really good songs including the actual song plan b There's a lot of more romantic, lovey-dovey kind of songs in here. Not as much hard edge. Plan B probably being the best of those. Again, that's why I kind of gravitate towards that. Also, while not a hit, there's a song here that I absolutely love called So Little Kindness. So Little Kindness And this was also the album where afterwards they lost Chris Hayes, their lead guitar player. He kind of left the band at that point. So little by little, you're getting less frequent albums, band members kind of leaving. So little by little, this thing is still starting to happen. 
In 2010, nine years later, this is like, wow, this is the longest ever. They release the album Soulsville. And I honestly couldn't tell you if there's any real song that I grabbed onto from there. And the biggest reason for this is that once again, we're dealing with a covers album. This is them doing covers once again, similar to how they did with Four Chords and several years ago. You can definitely hear the soul influence on the music. Respect yourself. It's a little different, it's a little slower. And at this point, again, you're, you're talking about 2010 here, at this point, we are now 2009, and we have not seen a new album. I believe something is being worked on. However, there's a lot of other issues having to do with the band that could prevent this from happening. And the biggest one is a medical condition that Huey Lewis has developed in the last couple of years, which is, which is preventing him from being able to hear. And if he can't hear, he can't listen to his own voice, so he can't really sing that well because he can't hear his own music. So I believe that's something that's still being worked on. They had other things in the past. I remember, uh, I mean, like if you call them trivia fact, it's funny because uh, uh, if you have one of those music channels, most people do on their cable, and they play a certain song or a certain artist, and then they'll give you facts. I have one called, I think it's called Music Choice or something like that. And the other day, they had Huey Lewis on the news. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, he, he, got, he scored a perfect SAT score when he was young. He's very smart. He traveled the, the country playing a harmonica. He hitchhiked. He went all over Europe. Uh, you know, all the little facts, gold records and hits and this and that. And then all of a sudden, they mentioned something about, oh, and his big break came when he recorded a disco song. And I'm like, What? I've never heard of this. I've never bothered reading up on this, but I found it on YouTube. It's incredible. Before he was Huey Lewis in the news, as a matter of fact, his real name is Hugh Anthony Craig III. And little by little, through different bands, he was in a band called Glover. Before uh, Huey Lewis in the news, it was called Huey Lewis and the American Express. Uh, you know, he, he kind of kept modifying his name until he got to the point where it was Huey Lewis. But before he got his first record contract... Uh, apparently in, in England, he recorded with whatever band he happened to be with at the time, a parody disco song called Exo Disco, which is, uh, again, it's a parody of the m theme from the movie The Exodus set to a disco beat. I don't have much information about it. The only thing I've been able to find is that it has something to do with the fact that it was at a time when they were doing like parody songs because disco was dying so people were recording these goofy disco-ish kind of songs so you can set any song to a disco so and i remember it happening you know, star wars has a disco version battlestar galactica has a disco you know miko made a living uh, for a time being out of turning anything anything into disco <laughs> so apparently huey lewis tried that and it's actually on youtube i actually found it i'll put a link to it it's ridiculous but you can actually hear his voice it's like oh my god this is for real and again from from what i little i've read it was a goof it was just a goof that he did and it worked because somebody said hey this guy is a good singer let's get him signed to do something and that led to eventually the first album so you know I remember there was also another incident I remember with the band where they ended up suing Ray Parker Jr., I think, and the makers of Ghostbuster because they claimed that the music for Ghostbusters was uh, ripped off. The, the, the song Ghostbusters by Ray Parker Jr. was ripped off from I Want a New Drug. And the records show that, yeah, uh, I think it was Universal at the time, they approached... Huey Lewis to write a song for them and he didn't write it so for whatever reason it was more or less decided that yeah it looks as like this somehow this song was copied to a certain extent to I want a new drug and whatever was this because the case was kind of agreed to uh, settle they the, the the exact contents were not there to be made public as to how much money Huey Lewis got you know for what happened but, again, if you go to YouTube, you might be able to find some interviews with Ray Parker Jr. or even Huey Lewis, both of them kind of telling their side of the story. Interesting little bits. He also had other roles 
in other movies, uh, a lot of them small roles, but he did have a pretty big role in the movie Duets, where he does play a pretty big role and he does sing. He, there is a song in Duets, which is a pretty nice song, you know, to, to be added to the collection of good songs by him. Plus, if you guys remember USA for Africa, that song that was recorded after the Grammys, I think it was, or something, where all of the uh, music performers went and recorded that song in 1984 and recorded a music video of the recording of the song. This is when Michael Jackson was at his heyday and Bruce Springsteen and, you know, all these heavy hitters. Huey Lewis was prominently pictured there, you know, he was participating in that big famous music video. Another interesting little side note uh, to Huey Lewis and the news, the movie American Psycho has a sequence where they're playing hip to be square while something is happening in the movie, let's put it that way. And I know it was something they were not very happy about. To the effect that they did not allow the song to be used in the soundtrack, in the actual selling of the soundtrack. The song made it to the movie, but not to the soundtrack. Many, many years later, Weird Al Yankovic did a parody video of the movie's scene playing that song, which stars... Huey Lewis as the lead character of American Psycho in that sequence. So it was really, really funny to see kind of like him get revenge for something that was done that he did not appreciate. So that was that's kind of like another like little funny antidote having to do with the band. I'll include that link too. Now, another couple of albums that officially came out, which this happens a lot with bands when they when they last a long time, is the compilation or the greatest hits versions of their of their songs. And Huey Lewis on the News actually has a total of about three, I would say, official compilation CDs. One of them is called Time Flies, the best of Huey Lewis on the News. The other one is called Greatest Hits. And the other one is called Collected. I own these. They're somewhat different. One of them, I believe, might have been only released internationally, but it is an official one. And it has a lot of like remixes and really rare, rare stuff, including that Exo Disco thing I was telling you guys about and some other stuff from their previous band name, American Express, Hugh Lewis and the American Express, and even some stuff from his Clover years. It also has a cut that he did for the movie Pineapple Express. So there, there are a few little things out there still kind of like permeating out there. And this is the big one. This is the one that kind of compiled all these kind of strange cuts of, of his songs into a three disc CD set. The other one before that, which came out in 2007, was more of a straight greatest hits type of thing, you know. And this is something that the sometimes bands kind of work into their contract in terms of saying, you know, we're going to do four albums, let's say. And a lot of times they kind of break it up by including a greatest hits kind of album and the one before that was in 96 also called time flies the best of you lose in the news again you don't really need to own all of these because they're a little bit repetitive but the last one is the one the the one called collected that from 2017 that's the one that really is very different because it has such rare material that we haven't seen yet in the regular albums that he put out now another unusual entry into all this so you know you have your as i mentioned before you have your original music then you have your covers like what he did for four chords and several years ago what he did for soulsville but in the mix there after plan b what he puts out is something called live at 25 what this is is basically a live album uh, there's plenty of plenty of concerts available on video, some originally only on VHS. I remember I bought one of the first ones, but this one is supposed to be their 25th anniversary album where you have still some of the original, not all of them, but some of the original performers. What I purchased at the time was the DVD version of this album. Instead of buying the album, I bought the DVD because I figured I'd rather watch this uh, than just listen to it. So... Yeah, it's good as far as concerts go. And, you know, if you like Huey Lewis concerts and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. However, obviously, you don't get anything, any new material. That's what makes it a little different. Well, 
this again is why you know many reasons why I like this band. Will we ever see another album come out? I don't know. The odds are pretty low at this point. Uh, you know, I he is still suffering from this condition, and I don't know if it's enough for him to prevent him from recording something. I mean, he most likely cannot tour, but I don't know if he can still record. So we will see what happens. Like I mentioned earlier, this is one of those situations where, you know, in your life, you will designate, this is my favorite this, and this is my favorite that. So when it comes to music, pop music, rock music, my selection is Huey Lewis and the News. I know that it's all kind of based in this period in time that is very influential to people my age. The early 80s, when we were teenagers. Our teenage years, I guess, historically will always be very influential on people. But maybe it's because of the times we live in now, because of the mass, mass consumption of pop and consumer materials and pop culture and, you know, all this kind of stuff that we were just bombarded in the 80s with and continue to be bombarded these days, at, you know, at our age and at younger ages for people that are still, you know, young at this time. Maybe it's because of that. I don't know. But I do know and I do have this thing that I mentioned before with somebody like Bill Paxton, who was kind of like, he was like my actor in the 80s. This this actor that I kind of grabbed onto and I would watch him in anything and defend them on anything. Huey Lewis and the News became that for me as far as music went. So I honestly don't know if there's anything more that's coming, but, you know listening to that kind of music and those hits from that time not only does it bring me back to that time but it you know it it gives me this connection that i also have with certain movies certain directors certain actors that you kind of claim as your own in a way which is an interesting very interesting phenomenon in the world of fandom well, just as you sometimes have it on this show, as soon as we're ready to put the show to bed, breaking news. Well, one of the things that I did hear about a little bit earlier was that Huey Lewis and the News were working on a new album. And as I mentioned before, the status of this album was kind of questioned at some point because of the fact that he got sick. You know, he also got involved, I think, uh, with producing a Broadway play, a musical about... I think it was called The Heart of Rock and Roll, which is, you know, a lot of his music from the 80s. And it was something kind of to do, from what I understand, while he was kind of dealing with this illness that he was trying to figure out. But again, at the same time as this is happening, there apparently was an album in the works and they were still planning on putting it out. Now, granted, the illness that he has is preventing him most likely from touring uh, which he announced that he couldn't tour anymore because he could not hear himself. However, it might still allow him to record, you know, in a controlled environment, you know, not going on these grueling tours that these guys go, you know, they spend most of the year on tour. So we knew that there was something in the works, but we just, you know, I just didn't know if it was ever going to happen or not. So the funny thing is, like I said, I finished the show like two days ago. And, you know, I'm a little bummed out in terms of when I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, this is it, man. You know, it, between the last albums, it's it was like years and you know, like almost 10 years between albums. You know, the last album uh, was, you know, more, more of a cover album as opposed to the one previous one in 2001, which was more of an actual, you know, original music. And, you know, we, we are do original music. And there were some interviews still floating around there. I started researching and researching. And yeah, yeah there are some interviews you know, that go back earlier this year, talking about how he, they got a new music deal with, I think, BMG, and there are some articles floating around. The BMG, ironically enough, I did mention BMG and Columbia House, but BMG, I guess, still has some kind of a record label out there, uh, and, and they made a deal for an album. And then the question is, when is this album coming? And there, the, the, there was word about, you know, it's coming in the spring, and I thought they meant spring of this year. And spring came and went and no album and not a peep anywhere. I just couldn't find them any little trace or an inkling, except for the fact that there are a couple of interviews here or there talking about how, yes, he's still kind of working on this album. Well, lo and behold, I get a, a Facebook a link sent to me. Guess what? There's a Huey Lewis in the News song posted on YouTube. I'm like, oh my God. So 
one of the things he mentioned in one of these other interviews I mentioned I, I was talking about is that he says he wanted to kind of go back to the 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 roots of sports, which is again my favorite of his albums, you know, overall albums. And the song that's out there right now, it's called Her Love Is Killing Me. And it does have that fast, fast beat. I would compare it a little bit to harder rock and roll. I don't think it's as hard as I Want a New Drug or Hip to Be Square or Working for a Living, but it's got that that 50s little bit of it, you know, going through it. Her love is killing me. And I can't wait, because I believe he had mentioned that he they had, at, at the time of that interview, which again, was a while back, they already had recorded about seven songs. They had seven songs in the can already. So I'm hoping that we're going to see this, whether it's in the next spring or later this year or whatever. But the bottom line is that there's a song out there already. And it does have what I'm listening to very much, you know, reflective of uh, the Heart of Rock and Roll, if you like that song. Now, one interesting thing about this new single uh, that is out there, because I started searching the internet for the single just to watch the not to watch but to kind of listen to because again they haven't put out a music video for it yet i don't know if they will but what's funny is that all of a sudden it started showing up on previous years live performances so i started going back and back and back and back and the farthest i can go on youtube is from a performance in 2015 so this is like almost a this is like a four or five year old performance where he is playing this new song and it sounds just like it so it's interesting that some maybe i don't know how many at least one of these songs that are going to be released as part of this album have been recorded before or at least he's been playing them before and then i read somewhere else also something about how a majority if not all again of these new songs that are coming out he was able to record them little by little before he was fully diagnosed with the illness that he has called minor's disease uh, and according to what i see here it's a disorder of the inner ear that is characterized by episodes of feeling like the world is spinning kind of like vertigo and also ringing in your ears tinnitus hearing loss and a fullness in the ear typically only one ear is affected initially however over time both ears may become involved Again, this is something that he's dealing with, and he is hopeful that he will be able to be treated in some shape or form and be able to come out of this, you know, on the positive side. And also, as far as the release of this album, there are certain sources quoting that it is definitely a 2020 album. So not sure if it was delayed or if it was 2020 originally supposed to be that year or if it was supposed to be 19, but then they pushed it to 2020. I'm not sure. The point is that it's coming no matter what. And these things have been recorded. So that's the most important thing. It is, you know, the more I think about it and the more that I try to listen to other people reviewing Huey Lewis and chronicling Huey Lewis, and it is kind of what I was saying, that he managed, you know, to combine in his albums a little bit of modern rock, 50s rock, and even a little bit of 50s doo-wop, if you think about it, because there are some acapella songs in there that he kind of mixes up, and, and you know, they kind of throw that in there, too. You know, you have, you have obvious, you know, the guitar solo, which is a staple of, of, of rock and roll, not only from the 80s, but, you know, it's got that 50s twang to it, that, that rawness. You hear the keyboard solo sometimes, and he's like, ooh, wait a minute, keyboard solo? What the heck is that? You know, you have the horn section that they get their little turn, and sometimes it's built into the into the song itself. It used to be the Tower of Power that used to tour with them. Now it's a different group of, you know, for the horn section. You, you hear these sounds that are not associated, no way in hell, they're associated with today's music. But even back in the 80s, you know, it was kind of hearkening back to another time. And that's kind of what you get, you know, with the Huey Lewis album, you know, his original stuff. And the fact that he does all these, or he's done these cover albums, you know, you can kind of tell where their inspiration comes from, but from those classic, uh, you know, 60s and 50s uh, rock and roll songs. And in this particular cut that was just released yesterday, September 26th, it's not a music video. It's just the cut. Yeah, 
I hear it. I can hear it. There it is. It's right there. They, they, you know, when they want to, when he wants to, he can go right there to that spot and bring you back to sports. I can't wait to hear the rest of it. I hope there is a little bit of everything in it. Like, for example, like I said, the little harder rock, edgier stuff that I like. I like this kind of stuff, too. So uh, this really, it, it made my day because it was one of these things where it's like, Things are ending. Things are, you know, my my, my heroes and, and the people that I grew up with admiring, you know, because they were already older than me when I started with them, they're getting to be up there in their age. And some of them are passing away unexpectedly. Some of them, somebody like Bill Paxton that I'm going to do a show on, you know, it's like, oh, my God, what happened? It's like, what, what do we do now? You know, it's it's silly, but it's just part of your childhood and then it's like all of a sudden that's gone and you know with Huey Lewis I wasn't hearing much about him lately and it's like and I know he was having some trouble and it's like oh no that means there's no more music coming but this is perfect this is exactly what I needed you know to uh get me back on track and anticipate you know I wish I could say that he's going to be pumping out material faster than every 10 years or ever again but at this point you know what I'll take what I can get and there are little gems out there that they're funny. You know, that, that exo disco thing I was telling you about before. <laughs> That's like bizarre. And even something that is so offbeat in terms of nothing to do with his personal album, something like duets, where he did that duet. That is a great song too. Very different, a very slow kind of song. But here you get this infusion of... Classic Huey Lewis in the News. All right, everybody, this brings us to the end of today's episode. This was a strange episode because it was going to be kind of like a remembering Huey Lewis as he more or less goes into retirement, let's say, but turned into, oh my God, there's something new coming. So it has a little twist, you know, ending. Uh, a little twist to the story at the end, which I'm very happy with, and I cannot wait. I just cannot wait to hear the rest of what's coming. So, as usual, thanks, everybody, for listening, and we will see you here soon at Geek Fest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. Do you like American Psycho? It's okay. Although originally polarizing to audiences and critics alike, it developed a much-deserved cult following when released on digital video disc or DVD. There it found a second life and really came into its own commercially and artistically. The movie works both as a grim examination of male vanity while also maintaining real genre thrills, justifying these tonal shifts by placing the audience inside the head of the duplicious lead character. Christian Bale's dynamite performance gives it a big boost. The role almost went to Leo, but nobody could have brought that certain pathos and charisma to it quite like Bale. A role he later recalled a shade of in Christopher Nolan's Batman pictures. Hey. Yes, Al? Why are there newspapers all over the place? Is that like a Huey Lewis on the news joke or something? <laughs> no, Al. <laughs> is that a raincoat? Yes, it is. In 2005, Alliancegate released this, The Uncut Vision. I think it's an undisputed masterpiece, a movie so entertaining, most people probably don't listen to the message. Most people probably don't listen to the words. But they should, because it's not just a great character study, but a sardonic metaphor for 1980s greed and materialism. Hey, Al! Ah! Try parodying one of my songs now, you stupid bastard. <laughs> If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2019. <laughs>